In this podcast, we're going to talk about hybridization of orbitals. All right, so, so far we know about atomic orbitals, which are sp, d, and f. But when we're looking at the shapes that we've learned from Vesper, they don't explain the molecular geometry. So if we're looking at the example of methane, which is CH4, we know from Vesper that the shape is going to be tetrahedral. But when you're thinking about what's actually involved in the bonding, the valence electrons of carbon are in uh, 2 in the s orbital and 2 in the p orbital. So there'll be 2 in the 2s and 2 in the 2p. Well, we know that two fifth p orbitals are at 90 degree angles to each other, but that's not what we get when we have a tetrahedral shape. So this is not really making sense. So what really happens when we bond is that atomic orbitals change and they hybridize when we form a molecule. Here's a picture of the uh, 2p orbitals. So you see that you have a pz, a px, and a py. And we know that they're 90 degrees to each other, but we know that a tetrahedral geometry has 120 degree bond angles. So this doesn't really make any sense. The two models do not match one another. So we have to come up with a new model that explains everything that we have observed. And this leads us to what's called molecular orbitals. Molecular orbitals are when you have atomic orbitals, SPDFs, from separate atoms, and they combine and hybridize to make a molecular orbital. Um, each molecular orbital is going to have room for two electrons, and there are two types of molecular orbitals. There are sigma, which are between bonds, and there are pi, which are above and below atoms. All right, here you see um, some sigma bonding orbitals that are s orbitals. We have an s orbital that are on separate atoms, and when they approach one another, we see that they actually hybridize and form a new orbital. This is the sigma bonding molecular orbital. All right, p orbitals can also sigma bond um, if they are side by side. So we have two p orbitals from separate atoms, and then they are going to come together and hybridize to form a sigma bonding molecular orbital p orbital. Okay? All right, now let's look at pi bonding. Pi bonding is going to occur above and below the atoms, so the little dot in the middle is like the atoms themselves, and then when they come together and combine, we see that they actually form these hybridized p orbitals. Okay? Pi bonding orbitals, molecular orbital. All right, so sigma and pi bonds, a little bit more. All single bonds are going to be sigma bonds. A double bond is going to give you one sigma and one pi, so that'll be one bond that is going to be in the plane of the atoms, so they're coming right at each other. And then one bond will be a pi bond, which will be above and below the atom. Okay, a triple bond is going to be one sigma and two pi bonds. Okay, so you're going to have actually two um, above and below the atom there. Okay, all right. Um, bond formation is associated with the overlap between atomic orbitals. Um, overlap is stronger in sigma than in pi bonds. So sigma bonds have a larger bond energy than pi bonds do. The presence of a pi bond also prevents the rotation of a bond. Okay, so these pi bonds, um, because of how they are above and below, they actually restrict the movement and they result in structural isomers. Okay, so we have, here's a good example of a structural isomer. We have hydrogen and bromine, and then hydrogen and bromine, but on the bottom it's kind of cut off here, but you have a hydrogen and a bromine on this side, and then on this side it's flipped. You have a bromine and then a hydrogen over here. So they're structural isomers because the pi bond in the double bond here is preventing the carbons from rotating around. So you get one where you have two hydrogens on the same side and bromines on the same side, and then you get another one where the bromines are across from one another and the hydrogens are across from one another. All right, so <clears throat> let's look a little more. All right, so here we see that we have, um, when we blend S and P orbitals, uh, we end up with a tetrahedral geometry. So if we take one S and three P orbitals, we will get a sp3 hybridization that has a tetrahedral geometry. All right, so let's look at some pictures. All right, so we take, this is a carbon. So we have, uh, so you're thinking about the 
CH4 example. Okay, so you've got a uh, single bond, or not a single bond, an S orbital here. You have the three P orbitals, and they all combine to form these hybridized SP3 orbitals. The SP3 orbitals, there are four of them, and they all combine to make the tetrahedral shape that we know is associated with the CH4 molecule. Okay, so if we take all of these and combine them into the hybridized orbitals that are formed when we bond, we get the correct geometry as predicted by Vesper. All right, in terms of energy, we know that the 2s is lower energy than the 2p. So where does the sp3 hybridized orbitals fall in? Well, they actually have a higher energy than the 2s, but a lower energy than the 2p. So they're more favorable overall in terms of bonding because they do have a lower energy. All right, so how do we actually get hybridization? How do we figure this out? Well, we know the geometry from experimentation. Okay, so we've experimented and we've learned the geometry at this point. Um, we know the orbitals of the atom. And then if we hybridize the atomic orbitals, it explains the geometry that we've learned from experiments. So if the geometry requires a tetrahedral shape, it is going to be sp3 hybridized. So anytime you have a tetrahedral shape, you know that you have to have sp3 hybridized orbitals. That also includes any tetrahedral electron geometries that might have lone pairs. So like bent and trigonal pyramidal molecules um, would still have sp3 hybridization, but some of the sp3 lobes will just be holding a lone pair instead of a bonding pair. All right, so the power of hybrid orbitals is they can be used to explain both bonding and molecular geometry. So here we have our Lewis structure, and we know that we're going to have um, a tetrahedral shape. And then if we have sp3 hybridized, it shows the exact shape, and it makes sense with our sp, d, and f atomic orbitals that we've spoken about before. All right, let's move on to a different type of hybridization. This is sp2. All right, so a good example is going to be C2H4. SP2, you're going to have three um, different bonding lobes. So this is going to occur in trigonal planar geometry. And we're going to end up with the three blended orbitals to satisfy that trigonal planar geometry. So this is going to leave one P orbital that we have not hybridized. So we're going to hybridize two of the P orbitals with the S to make some SP2s. And that'll leave us one regular p orbital. Okay, so if you're looking at this, you're going to take the s orbital and two p's from the carbon atom on that example, the C2H4 molecule, and they're going to hybridize to form the sp2 orbitals. Okay, now all of these orbitals are going to have a trigonal planar geometry. Okay, but that also leaves us one p orbital that will be perpendicular up and down. Okay, so the PZ will still be here up and down. All right, so here's a good picture of that. So we have our, these are our SP2 hybridiz, uh, hybridized orbitals, the pink ones. And then we have these blue P orbitals up and down. All right, so here is a, another picture of our C2H4 molecule. So we, here we have our carbon atoms. The pink ones, again, are our hybridized orbitals. The... Um, SP2 is sigma bonding with the hydrogens on each side of the carbon, okay? And then we also have a sigma bond occurring between SP2 orbitals from each of the um, carbon atoms. Now, notice we still have this P orbital that was not hybridized up and down on both carbon. That's going to be where your, pond, uh, your pi bonding is going to occur. So if we see down here, here's a different picture. We took out all of the hybridized orbitals, and we just left the two p orbitals that were not hybridized at all on each carbon atom, and we see that they actually pi bond, okay? So these two combine to form the pi bond that we saw earlier, okay? So we have a sigma bond here, and then we have a pi bond occurring here. So there are carbon is sigma bonding with the hydrogen, each of them, so that's two sigma bonds there, and he is sigma bonding with the other carbon as well as pi bonding with the other carbon, okay?
Here's a different look at it um, as far as the pi bonding goes. So we have these two, and then they hybridize, or uh, yes, hybridize into a pi bonding orbital above and below. All right, in terms of energy, sp2s, um, we have 2s is lower than the 2p. So where does the um, sp2 fall in this? Well, he's going to still fall lower than the 2p. Okay, so that means he is more favorable to form, uh, the, it's more favorable for the carbon to form an sp2 hybridized orbital than it is for it to try to form a, um, try to bond with a regular spdf orbital. All right, now what if you only have two things? Okay, just two things coming off. How would that hybridize? Well, that's just going to be one s and one p. Okay, so here we have an s and a p. It's going to give us a linear formation, so we're going to end up with two um, lobes on either side. All right, here's an example. Here's uh, one of them together. Here's a, again, a carbon atom. And we see that the carbon atom has the two remaining p orbitals that were not hybridized. And then it has the s and p, the sp hybridized orbital that's a combination of the s and the p right in there. Okay, so the p orbitals that were not hybridized still remain at a um, right angle. And then the two that are hybridized are 180 degrees apart. Okay, so this is going to make more room for the pi bonds and the sigma bonds. Okay, so we see this type of sp hybridization when we're talking about triple bonds or if you have two double bonds. So let's see some examples of that. Um, in terms of energy, of course, you probably have guessed by now that sp is lower than energy in energy than the 2s and the 2p. Okay. All right, so here's a good example of two double bonds. Okay, so here, um, this is the carbon atom. We have the sp hybridized right here, and then we have the regular p orbitals. And then down here, we have the oxygen. Okay, now see oxygen, he has a lone pair, a lone pair, and then this bond. So he has three things coming off of him. So he's gonna be sp2 hybridized himself. So we have the sp2 hybridized shown in green, and then we have the regular p orbital. Okay, and then you combine these pictures down here, and you have sigma bonding occurring right here between the carbon and the oxygen, okay? And then you have double bond right here, pi bonding between the untouched, unhybridized p orbital on the oxygen and one of the unhybridized on the um, carbon. Then on the other oxygen, you still have your sigma bond sigma bond occurring between the sp2 and the sp orbital, and then the other non-hybridized um, p orbital on the carbon will pi bond with the untouched p orbital on the oxygen. All right, here's another example, N2. N2 is a triple bond, so this is a triple bond example. So we're going to have our nitrogen. It's going to take one S and one P and hybridize them to an SP. And we're going to get a sigma bond occurring between those. And then for simplicity's sake, uh, I took the SP out here of the nitrogen so we could just look at the P orbital. So we see that we have two pi bonds occurring in a triple bond because we have two different sets of P orbitals um, hybridizing there. All right, so here's a picture of it all together. So here's our sp hybridized orbitals. They're sigma bonding. And then we're going to have a pi bond between these and a pi bond between those. Okay, so we end up with two pi bonds. And here's another picture. This one is uh, C2H2. Again, we're going to have uh, hybridization. We have two pi bonds. And then we have our sigma bond. So that's a triple bond as well. All right, so... Um, when we're talking about sp, d, and f, we're talking about the localized electron model. Uh, sigma and pi bonding and any hybridization is going to be the molecular orbital model. Localized is good for geometry, but doesn't work well with resonance. And then seeing um, sigma bonds as localized works well. It's the pi bond and the resonance structures that can move. So now we're going to look at hybridization in resonance structures. 